Okay, it's uh, two o'clock. So something that, um, that I've been wanting to do for a while is talk about teaching C++ because I enjoy talking about things and I enjoy C++ and I enjoy passing on knowledge. And so I've, I want to talk about teaching C++ for quite a while. And I managed to achieve that at uh, C++ Edinburgh back in 2017, where I delivered a, a talk titled, Learning C++ Isn't Difficult, It's Teaching That's the Trick. And th I felt that talk was uh, moderately successful, so I decided to propose it to CppCon 2018. And I split it into three hour-long sessions, because I, there was more that I wanted to add, and I felt that instead of having one 90-minute talk uh, three one-hour talks that targeted different aspects of teaching C++ might, uh, might be more efficient. Uh, for example, teaching C++, teaching tooling that is related to C++, and uh, teaching undefined behavior, uh, and things that are related to those sorts of things uh, would be a, a good way to talk about teaching C++, because talking about C++ as a teacher is not exactly an easy thing to do. I got contacted by the conference organizer, and they, um, the, the conference organizers felt that the talk that I was wanting to give was a bit too directed at university teachers, rather than uh, teaching uh, as a consultant or as a, a blog author, someone who goes on YouTube and uh, delivers videos or writes a textbook. And so I was, I was asked to consider giving a different talk that tried to broaden the, uh, the, um, the range of my audience, so that way it could uh, target as many people as possible rather than a, a, a niche sort of audience. And so that's how uh, how to teach C++ and influence a generation came to be. It was uh, delivered at CppCon 2018, and this is the ACU edition. So moving forward, we're going to first talk about motivating students and then uh, how simplicity is an important thing not only when it comes to programming, but when it comes to teaching followed by tooling, which is something that we need to be talking about with our students as well to get them not only conscious of using tools, but also uh, considering which tools are appropriate for solving their problems, followed by a chat about C and its role in uh, teaching C++. Uh, we're then going to move on to uh, diversity and inclusion and why they're important for talking about um, teaching, and then followed Following that, we'll talk about uh, SG20, which is a study group that is um, con uh, concerned with looking at teaching C++ in the, uh, at, from a standardization perspective. I would like to thank everyone that's on screen, particularly JC Van Winkle, who has been a terrific uh, mentor and partner when it comes to discussing things uh, C++, as well as everyone else on screen, because they have all participated in helping in some way or another. This talk is also derived from How to Win Friends and Influence People, if the title of the talk uh, didn't give that away. Part of this talk is about engaging with your students. So there will be times where I will pause for a moment with quoted themes, and these themes are all taken from, uh, from this book, and that will be a moment where we can pause and, to reflect and chat. So rather than having questions all uh, shunted to the end, what, I will, uh, what I'll do is I'll pause for a moment and take questions intermittently. So feel free to uh, express your thoughts when, when those moments pop up. Now, when we're teaching, we need to engage with our students. We need to communicate with them, and communication means that we need to be on the same page. And being on the same page as a student is to understand their motivations, why they want to know C++, uh, or anything, really and move forward with, uh, with that. So before we continue, can I please get uh, a few people from the audience just to uh, let me know what they're interested in getting out of this talk, please? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Guy, you did speak as I was turning. All right, uh, sorry, you had your hand up, I can't see. So if I were to summarize that, it's that you would like to get a bit of a refresher on teaching C++ from a university perspective. Yeah, and where would you start? Wonderful. So people, if you have a project, 
for people who haven't programmed before. Okay, I do have a slide where I, I talk about that specific audience. Uh, it will be very brief, but I will get to that in just a few, a few moments. Uh, Guy, you were next. Yeah, I'm considering um, using my bounties and plenty of spare time to start um, mentoring people remotely. Uh, I'd like to, you know, have, open up five slots, offer them to, to just there and say, you know, if you want mentoring, sign up. So I think I've, I've never actually lectured, so I want more. I just, I just want an idea of what to look for when teaching. Sure. So to summarise, Guy would like to mentor people and would like to uh, get a bit of insight into that. Is it a good summary? Yeah, that's right. Wonderful. So I saw one at the back, and then I believe Samothy, and then if the light's not blinding me, Gareth. Wonderful. So at the very back. So uh, I teach um, Python pandas at the moment for investment banks, and a lot of those courses the more uh, the students have a physics Sure, uh, we, uh, we can take that offline. Um, but, but there is a section dedicated there as well. Uh, then I think it was Samfi, Gareth, and then I'll need to press on. So the summary there was that um, you feel that C++ is old, it's got uh, around about 40 years of history, and so it's not as hip as newer programming languages. How can we uh, get it to not be that way? The very next slide covers that, so I hope that will answer your question. Gareth? Uh, useful techniques in order to try to help peers uh, develop their skills. Yep. So usable techniques, um, and actually there is a survey that I'll be talking about, and there is a category that, you, um, that you've mentioned that I, I will be talking about uh, very, very soon as well. Okay, so I did uh, two kinds of surveys. I did one that was formal, where I queried people uh, using um, Google Forms. The other survey that I did was to read textbooks and uh, look at YouTube videos, online courses, uh, courses that are taught at universities that have been publicly made accessible. And I'm going to refer to this one as the informal survey. The common theme among the informal survey is that a lot of resources that I saw seem to, in the first few chapters, talk about C++ as a complex language. It's something that is introduced if you want to have control over, uh, control over memory or performance. You want to milk your CPU for every last uh, drop of uh, cycles that it can give you. It's low level. Um, it, it is uh, something you use for low latency uh, industries. And I consider these to be uh, criticisms, condemnations, and complaints about C++. These are things that are true about C++, but when you are introducing someone to C++ for the very first time, if you are saying that C++ is a complex language, right from the start, what you're doing is you're putting a barrier between C++ and the students. You're saying, essentially, you're not going to get there without a lot of trouble. And people don't like to interact with, uh, with barriers, so rather than criticizing or complaining about C++ from the get-go, what I'd rather do and what I'd rather encourage is to uh, promote C++. What can we build using C++ and talk about what C++ can help you achieve and implicitly talk about the complexity through the problems that we can solve using C++. For example, Renesas are uh, looking at using C++ to help build self-driving cars. Morgan Stanley use C++ to build their banking software. Uh, I know some people in the audience first uh, learnt C++ to write partial differential equation solvers. Uh, Google and Facebook use, um, use C++ for their particular um, applications. And my favorite one is that C++ has been used to build parts of the Mars rover, which means that C++ is literally out of this world. <laughs> what I would like for you to take away from this is that we ought to be making our students eager to learn C++. 
that, uh, that comes from praising what C++ has been used to achieve and at least initially getting the complexity of C++ pushed into the applications. None of these problems that are on screen are easy to solve, but that doesn't mean that we need to say that C++ is complex to learn. The complexity can be said, well, look, you want to solve, um, you want to solve animation software. You can go about uh, explaining, you know, this is what animation software is, and this is uh, what it looks like, and that will implicitly say, okay, this problem is non-trivial, I will need something that is a little bit more uh, advanced than what I currently know in order to get there. When I was planning this talk, I conducted a formal survey, as I previously mentioned. There were uh, several uh, questions that were mandatory, one of which was, how do you teach? Another one was, who's your primary audience? And uh, it was interesting to note that there was um, a, a random uh, assortment of different teachers who have now uh, collapsed into what is uh, titled as other. But we also have um, informal teachers, such as uh, what Gareth and Guy have been looking at with, uh, with mentoring, because those, aren't, th those are taking one-on-one -on -one, uh, peer to peer sort of mentor uh, mentoring, uh, rather than um, more traditional things such as university teaching, which actually came in at uh, third, where I combined university and technical college. Uh, and then primary school and high school came in uh, uh, at last. But it was very interesting to see that after informal, the next most common form of teaching was actually in-house training. And then uh, I also asked, uh, who is your primary audience? Because I was very uh, interested to see how many novices are being taught and how many experienced uh, programmers are being taught. And so what I did was I split up the results into novices to C++ and complete novices to programming and uh, as well as experienced C++ developers. I have very little experience teaching complete novices, and there are about 15 or more years of research dedicated to teaching complete beginners on how, on how to program. So my audience in this talk is mostly targeting people who have some programming experience, because that is where all of my experience lies. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can't take away from this talk, um, uh, particularly with interacting with your students, but it does mean that I'm, uh, I'm less confident in answering questions about those sorts of things. Now, simplicity is something that has been a recurring theme for C++ for many, uh, many years. We've had hundreds of talks about simplicity and several keynotes over the past few years from prominent speakers that, uh, that focus on simplicity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about why embedding simplicity into a course will help your students understand simplicity and will not scare them off from teaching C++, sorry, from learning C++. What I did was in my informal survey, I looked at uh, what is probably around about chapter three in the textbook or hour three in a course, uh, where you introduce the, uh, the initial types to students. And this is, so we're, we're talking about the fundamental types, and this is typically what I saw. So we'll have a table that introduces bool and char, and signed char and unsigned char. We'll sometimes go and mention WCHAR-T, and if it's a book on C++11, of which there are now a few more, um, it'll also cover CHAR-16T and CHAR-32T. If it's going to be a book on C++20, uh, I would imagine that those books that cover CHAR-16T and CHAR-32T to also cover CHAR-8T, because that's a brand new fundamental type. We'll then look at uh, all the integral types that are not characters, such as short, int, long, long, long. We'll then mention all of the unsigned variants. Some books uh, will also talk about how Signed int is the same as int, and short, signed short int is the same as short, so you can drop off all the extra uh, words. And then we'll move on to the floating point types, which are float and double and long double. And then, you know, someone will typically mention void at this point, because that's the, the final uh, fundamental type, really. Uh, and then we'll move on to the bits and the bytes, and how characters typically have eight bits, and, you know, the, 
there'll be some mention of ASCII or Unicode, uh, depending on who's written uh, the resource. And then we'll move on to the integral types and how short is typically 16 bits on an x86 uh, architecture. And we have int, which is typically 32. Uh, long is the weird one, because it might be 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on your platform. And so you'll have an asterisk down next to every single type that then says this size may vary depending on your platform. And then we'll mention flow, uh, which is IEEE 754 uh, single precision. And then double is going to typically be uh, IEEE 754 double precision. Long double is, again, a weird one like long, because it might be the same as double, or it might be um, an x86 extension, or it might actually be IEEE 754 extended precision. And if this is your third hour into C++, how are you going to feel? Run. Run. That's better than what I got at CppCon, which was run to the Python room. Yeah, I, uh, I don't encourage this, uh, this sort of mentality. Because what we've done is we've just bombarded uh, a group of students who are getting their first impression of C++ with 30-odd types, most of which they will not need to write their first programs using C++. <laughs> or most of which they shouldn't use anyway as well. Um, so what I like to do is I like to take a leaf from Biana's introductory book, Programming Principles and Practice Using C++, second edition, um, which introduces five types for um, starting people off with C++. Int for whole numbers, double for real numbers, string for text, char for single characters, um, booleans uh, for truth values. And because Biana's book is targeting people who have never written programs before, uh, it only introduces five types. It then waits a few more chapters before it introduces the next two types, which I think uh, should be introduced for teaching people who have experience writing programs before, namely vector for collections, because that is the bread and butter and the default uh, container type for C++ programmers, and uh, scoped enumerations, because finite sets are often uh, much nicer than having integers representing arbitrary values or even Booleans, because true and false don't communicate much information at all. So what I'm trying to communicate here is that we shouldn't be introducing things unless there is a genuine use case for you to introduce it. If you would like to substitute double for float because you're teaching something to do with GPUs and you feel that GPUs uh, should be preferring float, then by all means, substitute double with float because you've still only got one floating point number there. You're only representing real numbers using one type. You can introduce the other types later on. And something that uh, Bian has been talking about for 30-odd uh, years is using C++ as C++. Don't uh, shunt some sort of uh, part of C++ to, uh, to the back and then not use that because you don't like it, but rather try to keep everything uh, together, uh, which is how uh, most e uh, ecosystems work, uh, work together. I see your hand up. I have a section shortly after this. Um, and Herb even uh, mentioned this in his keynote the other day when he was talking about error handling. He could split his error handling uh, proposal into four separate papers, but what he has decided to do is to approach error handling as a whole and see um, how that can be solved rather than fragmenting it and risking having uh, a fragmented language as a result. When teaching, I encourage that you will uh, also uh, introduce people to things when they're necessary and where possible uh, rely on other features to help augment your reasoning for things. For example, in the informal survey that I conducted, I, talked about, uh, I looked at references. And the same is true if you're teaching C, uh, but the, the difference is that we'd have pointers on screen if this was a talk about C. And so what we have here is we are initializing an object with uh, the value 10, and then we're writing that to the character output. And then what we're going to do is introduce a reference, which is initialized to reference the object. And we're going to write that to the character output, which is going to print out the same result. Then we uh, will see that the book or the resource uh, writes, uh, we, we write five to the object, print them both out, and then it's now going to say five, five. Uh, and finally, whoop, OK. Uh, finally, we are going to introduce um, writing to the reference, and uh, we see that the results are eight. Now, as indicated by the Red Cross, I am not a fan of this, because it doesn't imbue into 
it doesn't imbue in students why they should care about references. They see that we can modify references, sorry, we can modify an object through a reference, but why couldn't we just do that using the object itself? Like, we, we, we could have done it that way. And uh, something that Kate and I were chatting about the other day was that if you give this, uh, this particular slide to someone who knows C++ sufficiently well, they may see that, yes, I know exactly what you're doing. Okay, we should put this in a book and teach people about it. But that doesn't cover what happens when someone who hasn't seen C++ uh, think, uh, what happens when they see this, and do they go, well, I, I understand it as well. Do I understand the meaning of it? And so rather than introducing references in isolation, how about we introduce them using functions instead? So on screen, we have an accumulation, um, and we're going to take a vector of points, and sorry, coordinates, and we're going to accumulate that and return that result. And then what we can do is we can talk about how when we pass by value, we are copying all the elements, and we can time that when we say have uh, 30 million elements. And the reason I picked 30 million is because it's about the highest that QuickBench would let me go. Uh, then what we can do is we can uh, do the same thing, but add an ampersand to indicate that we have a reference, run the same program again, timed again with 30 million elements, and then we can demonstrate the results. And we can see that on GCC, we have about an eight times improvement uh, when we're using reference to const versus passing by value. And on Clang with libc++, we have about a five and a half times uh, improvement when using a reference to const over passing by value. And then when you want to uh, explain what references are, we again can rely on functions because we can show how to swap where we have uh, two coordinates and we uh, we print the coordinates before and after the swap. At the moment, the swap doesn't do anything because it's uh, it's not being passed by reference. So when we pass it by reference, we can now see that, yay, the results are actually going to be swapped. And the key theme here is to talk in terms of your students' interests. Talking in terms of your students' interests means what can they achieve from this particular, uh, from this particular section of your class or of your book or of your video. You want them to be able to understand what it is you're talking about. And this relates back to getting them to want to have an eager uh, desire to learn about C++ because you're telling them what they can get out of C++. Now, I've got a few minutes to chat about, uh, about the, the last two sections. So I will now open up to the floor. I believe someone at the back had a, a point they wanted to raise. So if I were to summarize that, you're talking about using loops and uh, when you go to loop over, when you, when you attempt to uh, iterate over a, um, a vector using integers, um, how you talk about the, si uh, the signed versus unsigned um, comparison. Um, my answer to that is to encourage people not to use loops, to prefer algorithms wherever possible, um, because algorithms are a solution that has already been written by someone, it is correct, and it is something that is going to describe what is going on. I talk about that more in, uh, in a few slides' time. Um, but the other thing is, if you must use a loop, we also have range four, which is going to talk about how you are uh, how you're going from the beginning to the end, and we don't really care about the indexes. If you do need to worry about the indexes, then that's a discussion for a little bit later on. Perhaps you can structure the class so that way it doesn't actually rely on indices uh, from the beginning, but rather when you need to start addressing that. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, okay, Peter, you're the next hand that I saw, but did anyone else while I was going on that monologue have their hand up? No, no. okay, so no other hands. So Peter, then Samothy? Uh, you talk about having the basic character introduced of yarn hat, which yep. is basically the character the int, double, and so on. And then you gave your first example, which does not use any of those types, it uses auto. <laughs> does it really? Yeah. Ah, yes, it does, because... Auto, auto, auto. So what do you think we should be doing? Should we be explaining basic types and explaining that and then going to auto, or first explaining things with auto and then going to basic types? So I am a fan of Herb's auto, I think it's for tracking, where you say auto on the left 
and have a value on the right, but if you need to know what the value, what the type of the value is, then you explicitly construct it using the value on the right. Because then it essentially has a uniform sort of way of describing what it is. I am declaring a variable, and if you need to know what the type is, then I am defining it on the right. That's the same thing you had on the first slide that you used it, with, which had auto n equals 10, I think. Yes. So you would argue that you would be starting with auto with everything, and then later on it use types, or specific types. Ooh, that's a good question that I hadn't anticipated. Can I take that offline, please? Sure. Thank you. I will like, definitely hold me to that. And Samothy. How would you go about covering, uh, so you start introducing the types, um, and one of those types is the vector. Yep. Uh, in most languages, you have your arrays as part of the language. Mm -hmm. How would you go about saying, hey, here are all the integral types you were first, plus the vector, and please don't use it in normal arrays? I wouldn't mention normal arrays at all. Uh, because built-in arrays in C++ are very old. They're 40 plus years old now, and they have a whole host of problems. What I would start with is if you want to have a collection of things, you need to say uh, hash include vector, and then just start using std vector from there, there on. Does that answer the question? Sure. Okay. If, if I don't give a satisfactory answer and it's not a time-related thing, please let me know that, uh, that I'm not answering your question. Peter, last question. semicolon for anything in a standard library, and that would make teaching this part much, much easier. Because you start your program with import std, and then you have vectors, you have strings, you have all the native types as native types. Wonderful. Uh, okay, I need to press on, but there will be more time to talk about this sort of stuff at the very end. Uh, so please write down anything that, uh, that you really would like to talk about. Okay, so tooling is the bread and butter of every developer. The most important two tools for a C++ programmer are a text editor, because the butterfly effect that XKCD introduced isn't really that effective, and a compiler to translate from our source program to a target program. However, there are a host of other important tools that software engineers need to rely on to effectively write software. Uh, I was very happy to see that in the survey that I conducted, um, Teachers were encouraging uh, version control, profiling, debugging, and build systems quite uh, actively. Uh, more than two-thirds of teachers, uh, I surveyed 150 teachers, uh, and uh, more than two-thirds of them were encouraging uh, these tools. Uh, then a little bit further down, we had sanitizers, code formatters, and, uh, and Git-based interfaces such as, uh, such as GitHub. And then even further down, unfortunately, linters, continuous integration, package management, and code coverage are sufficiently underrepresented. What do we mean when we, see, uh, when we see the term good software engineering skills? This is something that, in some form or another, I do see on uh, job ads, which, uh, which say you, you need to have sufficiently good software engineering skills. And I believe that one of these terms uh, is, uh, sorry, what this term is referring to, or at least one part of what this uh, term is referring to, is the ability to write correct software. If we can't solve a problem, then our software isn't correct, and that means that the problem hasn't been solved. One way to guarantee, or sorry, to, to help us verify that, um, that our software is correct is to test our software. And indicated by the solid line, we have um, from correctness to testing, um, I was able to get data from this survey that indicated that teachers are encouraging some form of testing. But um, the, the survey indicated that testing frameworks, as indicated by this very broken line, uh, were not well represented. So a testing framework is something such as uh, DocTest or Catch2 or Google Test. Uh, there are a few others, but those are uh, the three that I'm aware of as being the major uh, players. Um, and so I think it's important that we take the time to express what a testing framework is and briefly explain how to use it. So that way tests can be more robust, more easy to digest, and are going to actually target what it means to write correct software, sorry, to test correct software. 
and how to catch problems that are uh, being uh, made apparent from tests in, uh, in the actual code that we are writing to solve a particular problem. Another uh, way in which we can get correctness is through high-level abstractions, and I'll be talking about this quite a fair bit. Uh, it is sufficiently represented, but not fully well represented, as indicated by the, uh, the semi-broken line. And part of the way we can use high-level abstractions to ensure correctness is to look at compile-time checks. Uh, compile-time checks ensure that our software is correct before we actually go to use it. And one thing I'm going to single out is the Mars Climate Orbiter, which crashed into Mars back in the 90s uh, due to the fact that NASA writes their software using metric units and Lockheed Martin writes their software using imperial units. And so there was a miscommunication uh, in the code which led to a miscalculation and so now NASA has a multi-million dollar investment in a hole on Mars. Um, this, NASA assumed responsibility for this because they said that at the end of the day, had their software interface uh, checked for, um, checked for uh, the units being correct, uh, then perhaps this would not have happened. And so if we're encouraging our students to use high-level abstractions, such as units, which are ingrained in mathematics classes, or at least New South Wales mathematics classes, um, when we're performing our calculations, then perhaps this problem would never have arisen at all. Because the compiler could have said, well, you're adding um, an integer to a meter, and that's not possible because integral um, you, you can't just add an integer, you need to wrap it in some sort of, in some, some sort of unit. That may have uh, led to their, uh, Lockheed Martin then wrapping it in feet, for example, and um, then trying to, add it to, uh, trying to add it to NASA's meters in their interface, which would then have either led to a compile time error where it says uh, you can't add feet to meters, but of course we can add me uh, meters to feet because they're two distances, and so one of those could have been converted. So we could have either had a compile time error, which would have been a little bit frustrating, but it still saves the day, or we could have had a conversion to some common type and then have it, that common type converted to whatever the final uh, stored type is. Because, of course, we can add meters to kilometers. It doesn't really matter if, uh, if, the, um, if the systems were the same or the systems were different. What matters is the, distant, uh, sorry, the, the units were the different parts. And that's what led to the problem. And they, whoop, wrong way. Uh, these can also be uh, checked through the compiler and through linters. Compilers, a, a compiler's primary job is to translate uh, a well-formed source program into a target program. But it can also issue optional diagnostics that, um, that can relate uh, <laughs> to some sort of questionable choice that a programmer might have made. Whereas a linter will just go through the program, at least uh, to my, the best of my knowledge, will only go through a program to find uh, questionable choices. And so it will then flag those questionable choices. We call these questionable choices that are being diagnosed uh, warnings. And this is probably the most divisive part of the survey uh, that I conducted. Because I, I initially posted this on Twitter and then realized that I didn't want my, uh, my Twitter notifications to blow up overnight, so I moved to Google Forms. But in the time that it took me to do that, I realized that the, um, the survey on do you turn warnings into errors was uh, very much 50-50, always and forever. And then when I looked at the Google Forms survey results, it turns out that it was about 60-40 in favor of turning on warnings as errors. And the, uh, the arguments were, uh, very much the same amongst both, uh, both camps. We had people who were arguing against turning on warnings as errors, uh, saying that it's noisy, it's disruptive, um, and then the people on the, uh, uh, who were in favor of turning warnings as, on, warnings as errors on, uh, saying things uh, such as, well, when are too many warnings actually too many warnings? Uh, Kate gave a great example um, on, on Twitter saying, well, is the 249th warning the last warning that we can trust? Why is 250 special? And that was uh, a, a really great way of summarizing why warnings as errors is a great thing to, uh, to consider. And then when I talked about this with the folks at CppCon, 
Um, I had on the right-hand side of the audience someone who is responsible for maintaining a quarter of a billion lines of code, um, of library code, uh, saying that while this was an, uh, an ideal that they'd like to get behind, they, um, they, they pointed out that many compiler warnings are contradictory and other compiler warnings aren't, uh, aren't high quality. Uh, and the, the reason for that isn't because, um, because of any particular reason, but rather because humans write compiler warnings and humans make mistakes. So we can't just blindly trust the compiler. But then on the other side of the room, quite literally, um, there was someone who used to work for the MSVC team, and they were saying that, the, um, that a lot of their clients use um, or turn on all warnings and then use warnings as errors, as so that is an incentive for them to actually write high quality warnings, write um, warnings that don't contradict each other. And so that then led to me changing my perspective a little bit on how to articulate this point. And that really has uh, surmised as we should be encouraging our students to turn on as many warnings as possible and then turn on warnings as errors and get the compiler or the linter to scream as loudly as possible because then we can go and investigate each and every single individual uh, problem and evaluate was that a mistake or was that something that we intended to do. And this then goes back to, uh, to Kate's talk about what do we mean when we say nothing at all. And uh, for example, if we are doing a narrowing conversion from a double to an integer, is that if we don't provide a static cast, then we don't know if we intended to make that change. But if we do provide it, then we are explicitly suppressing that warning and saying, I wanted this conversion, which means that if we don't have, the, uh, if we don't have that cast, then we can either add it or go, no, this was definitely a mistake. And this will help, if we encourage our students to turn these on, it will help students in, uh, realize that writing software is not a trivial process and it will encourage them to find their faults as early as possible. And we've talked about correctness when, uh, at a compile time, from a compile time perspective, but uh, there's also the runtime perspective. For example, um, debuggers, profiles, and sanitizers, all of which got very good representation in the survey, uh, things that can help us evaluate software from a runtime perspective, things that a compiler or a linter or a static, uh, static analyzer can't actually catch for us. Uh, and so I didn't capture, do you teach how to use these kinds of uh, tools or do you just mention them and say, uh, go forth and use them? I do hope that teachers are taking the time out, like have a bit of time in a lecture a week or an appendix, or even if you just mention where to find resources on this, on, on using these tools, so that way students don't just uh, open up Valgrind, for example, and completely misuse it to locate a, uh, a particular problem. The one thing that didn't seem to have as much representation is contracts. And I don't mean just C++ 20 contracts, which are on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, what I mean is uh, just asserting preconditions and postconditions. Um, you can already do this in, uh, in C++ 98 using the assert uh, macro, but you can go further and articulate your preconditions and your postconditions using variable, uh, sorry, macros named um, expects and ensures or pre and post. And then when the language uh, feature arises, you can change from using macros to using uh, the language feature. You don't actually need to rely on a language feature's existence to incorporate contracts. And these help us with programming, uh, locating programming errors. The other thing that uh, the good software engineering skills um, help us with are uh, not reinventing the wheel. So, not spending t more time solving a problem that has already been solved than we need to. I almost, I've got, uh, you, there'll be, after this bit, you'll have some time to chat about that. Um, sometimes we spend more time trying to automate monotonous tasks than we do actually, than it would actually take to solve said monotonous task. 
uh, not reinventing the wheel, however, comes in several different flavors, uh, two of which are version control and build systems. Version control helps us not reinvent the wheel by not having to copy a file into version 1A and then have a few tweaks from the original copy, and then version 1B, which is slightly different from version 1A, and then version 2, which is majorly different from version 1B, uh, um, and then having to roll back by going through each file manually, which you could accidentally delete or uh, accidentally edit and then not realize that. Uh, so version control is something that uh, can improve students' lives because if they know how to use uh, Git or Mercurial uh, or Subversion, then they can uh, avoid having to maintain many, many files and can just get on with the job of, uh, of writing their software. Build systems is another important uh, component because it means that they don't have to manually compile and manually link, manually test, uh, yes, the compiler does, uh, oh, sorry, compiler front ends these days do uh, do the, the compiler component, the assembly component, and the, uh, the linking component all in one, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do that for every single file in your software. Uh, this can help improve your students' lives because it means that they don't have to go and manually rebuild everything. They can just type make or ninja and the target they want to, uh, to build. And you don't even need to teach your students how to effectively use something, uh, a build system. Can I show your hands, please? Who, um, who here knows CMake? Okay, can, it, it, even marginally. Uh, can I get you to keep your hands up, please, if you learnt CMake by following an example from some person on GitHub's library or some other online library? Okay, that's sufficiently fewer hands than I was expecting. Um, but what I'm trying to communicate is that you can offer your students a, um, a pre-built project template that has, uh, has all the, the gory details done for them and just show them how to integrate uh, into that so they can add a new test or add a new source file. One thing that didn't get sufficient uh, representation is package management. And package management has been a, a bit of an ongoing issue for C++ programmers for the last, I think, 18 to 24 months, which is, um, which is a bit of a problem because it's a convenient way for us to get libraries uh, into our ecosystem uh, quite easily. And this brings us back to high-level abstractions, which lead us into libraries, because libraries such as the standard library or range v3, absale, boost, uh, the guideline support library, just to name a few, are uh, all uh, pre-written solutions to solving some sort of problem. And if we spend our time, for example, writing a JSON parser, then uh, we're not actually solving the problem of uh, whatever we wanted to use JSON uh, for. We're spending our time writing the JSON parser. Whereas we can pull one probably from Boost because um, uh, probably from Boost, and that can help us solve the problem. But of course, installing libraries is a uh, is a slightly difficult task, and so that's where package management comes in and gives us a little bit of a, a cyclic problem because we want to use libraries, but we need to know how to use package management. Again, you don't need to uh, teach your students everything about package management, just enough to get them started, and then if they have uh, other questions about expanding upon that, they can either ask you or they can, uh, they can write to you if you're not available online, uh, and you can provide them with other documentation. And this leads us to the next section, which I'm going to give a bit of a tease right now for, but won't take any questions until the end of the next section, and that is to teach C++, not C and C++, because C++ is a high-level abstraction language, and um, that is the, uh, the meat for the next section. So what I really want to communicate here is that we should be encouraging our students, and encouragement can come in the form of tooling, because it helps make solving a problem easier. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor for the next uh, three minutes to discussion. And I believe we already had one person uh, in the queue. Your point was, uh, don't let Sure. But they need to just to uh, do work, just to try, just to learn. At the same reason, I think it's important to learn 
forums early on, so that the club will understand what's happening. They need to understand. Already no, no notes. It's okay to use algorithms. But when you've never learned that before, in the first few weeks of learning programming, for loops and ifs are the things, and uh, array indices are the things you should learn. I think. So, Anna, is that a is that like a, a continuing the discussion? Sure. Uh, so. So um, I would say, for example, the JSON parser. If you want to learn to write a JSON parser, then test the problem to write a JSON parser. Then you go ahead and write a JSON parser. But if you say, I want to learn something else, where I need to use JSON, then do something else using a ready JSON parser and not go ahead and do everything. So use the tools that are available for the problem, but also learn to look to uh, solve those lower level problems. For example, learn to uh, write your own algorithm by using loops. But if you are actually not going to, to solve that specific problem, writing algorithms, then don't go ahead and write your loops and write your, algor and write your algorithms yourself, but use the algorithms that are there. So it's not about it's, it's it's about not reinventing the wheel. But if you have to, if you want to learn at some point how to make a wheel, then you have to make the wheel, but not to reinvent the wheel every time you have to solve. Of course, that's for everything. But you have to uh, learn to <coughs> how a wheel works. Sure, but that's not the same as inventing the wheel. That's, that's a very interesting um, standard ease way of thinking here. Uh, so just for those who didn't hear, Peter has asked if we can, sorry, if I can ask the audience for um, a show of hands of people who are um, either for or against the idea of reinventing the wheel as a, uh, as a way of um, teaching. Is that essentially a summary of what you've just described? Not reinventing every wheel, but at least some wheels. So... Okay, so. So, how long is before for loops or the other? Sorry, uh, Kate, I didn't catch that last bit. Just ask early versus late on raw for loops. So, on raw for loops, can I get a show of hands, please, uh, for early versus late? So, early, people who are in favor of teaching for loops early in a class, can I get uh, people to raise their hands? Do you mean raw loops or for loops? Raw for loops. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to count that, but that's about, uh, I'd say, Half the room. Can I get a show of hands for people who are in favor of teaching loop, uh, raw for loops later on? That's the other half. <laughs> Which is great because. Uh, was there anyone who uh, wanted to abstain from that? <laughs> All right. Is there anyone who had broken arm? <laughs> We're one broken arm in the back. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't catch that. Depends on what you're trying to teach, depends on who your audience is, yes. And that is a great uh, way to walk into our conversation about C. Because this is the, uh, the next section. And so something that I asked, this is a mandatory question, every teacher had to answer this. Um, do you teach the common subset of C and C++ first? I was shocked, but also giddy with excitement to see that more than two-thirds of people teaching C++ do not teach the uh, common, what, what is commonly referred to as the common subset of C and C++ before they dive into what is C++. And I think the, the next most interesting column is the maybe column, because the maybe column are essentially people who called my bluff when I said common subset of C and C++, because I didn't really word the question much differently to what you, uh, what you have on screen, and so therefore it's been arbitrarily defined, and they get to decide what this common subset of C and C++ actually is. Now, if I uh, wanted to uh, fudge the results a little bit, I would have put them into the yes camp, but there are things that you do need to teach uh, when teaching C++, such as int, for example, it is common to both of them, so perhaps that's where the confusion lies, and that's why I've split it into uh, three columns rather than two. And 
The next thing that I want to mention is that Kate Gregory gave a talk at CPPCon 2015 uh, to talk exactly about C and C++. The talk was titled, Stop Teaching C, and it was delivered at a CPPCon, which is a C++ conference for C++ programmers to C++ programmers by C++ programmers. And Kate says in the first 30 seconds, this is not Kate saying, stop teaching C. There was an implicit subtitle where it was actually stop teaching C when you were teaching C++. Now, given that Kate stood up and talked about this on a Friday morning for 60 minutes means that there's probably very little that I can go on. We can just have a 30-minute early mark, right? <laughs> no. Uh, we, uh, Kate and I could chat about this for probably a week and still not reach the end of our conversation. Um, and what I have on slide is probably my favorite slide of the entire talk, where Kate is saying that C came first, and C++ builds on C, so therefore we should be teaching C first, right? But we don't teach mathematics in this way. We don't uh, teach English by first starting out with German and French, or uh, we don't uh, start with Middle English. We start by teaching uh, mathematics uh, in a way that makes sense. We start by teaching English in a way that makes sense. Can I get a show of hands now, please? Who here uh, is aware that C++ was built on C? Okay, please leave your hands up. Now, can you please leave your hand up if you think it's the only programming language that C++ was initially built on? Okay, so that's... Actually, surprisingly fewer hands than I thought. Uh, it, by built on, I mean that it is uh, the original language that it, was, that it came from. There's nothing else, no other influences. So C++, as some people in the audience are saying, uh, was built on Simula as well. But I am yet to see a programming class that teaches C++ by starting with either C and Simula, or just Simula on its own. We don't do that. Uh, or, or, or B, a small talk came well after C++, I believe. OK, OK. Um, so Simula is, the, uh, is also a basis for C++. And we can read more about this in the design and evolution of C++. And this, again, was a mandatory question that teachers had to answer. Um, I was disappointed to see that uh, there were sufficiently fewer teachers that had read this book than I, uh, than I was hoping. It's out of print, is it? It's actually hard to buy. That is a problem. Oh, okay. I was not aware of this. I, okay. That's uh, something I might have to chat with Bianca about. But uh, this book is a good way of uh, articulating the history of C++. And it's written... Uh, by someone who is a history enthusiast, um, and it, it, it captures the philosophy on why things are the way they are. And this book stops at 1994. After that, you need to go and read the history of programming languages journals, where Bianca writes a section of that for C++ every decade when the journals are published. He makes those papers available online uh, on his website. As a teacher, we are offering some, some form of critique uh, because we are imparting knowledge with our own opinions and our own biases. And this is, uh, this is why I feel that when teaching, we need to know why things in C++ are the way that they are. Wrong way. Remember that we want to keep things simple. And simplicity is something that pretty much everyone in C++ wants. I'd like to quote Herb Sutter who said in 2015 that C is a simpler language than C++. C++ code, on the other hand, is simpler than C code because it contains more information. It is simpler to deal with C++. And he said this because people often say that C is a simpler language. And from this, I want to demonstrate uh, what it's like to show C code versus C++ code. Because I, when, I demo, uh, when I gave this talk last time, I was told that, I, that it's unfair that when people get up on stage and contrast C against C++, um, there's always some sort of contrived example, and that contrived example shows C code being um, the, uh, 
the underdog. So on screen, we have an addition of two matrices. I'll give you, this is supposed to resemble, but it's not exactly the same as uh, what you'd see in the GNU scientific library. I'll give you a moment to absorb what's going on here, but essentially we have an, an A, matrix A and a matrix B, which we want to add, and it's going to be stored in the matrix as a result. Um, okay. Is there anyone that needs a bit more time? No, okay, can someone tell me what's wrong with this code, please? It is functionally correct. I will, I'm not trying to um, pull anything over your eyes. I'm not gonna have some sort of grand reveal. Well, okay, there is going to be a mini reveal, but it's not going to be something like, I'm not saying that the, the loops are wrong. To the best of my knowledge, they are correct. It's not checked for null. Thank you, Guy. It's not checked for null. So we've added a little bit uh, more to this code. Is this code now sound? Peter, what if the matrices are different sizes? So now this this simple this simple uh, function, which was only supposed to be three lines, is all of a sudden <coughs> quite large. And C++ can help us here with the aid of references because now we don't have to worry about null pointers. We can only we, we only have to take an A and a B. We don't have to worry about the result because the result is actually A. And we're going, we, we can throw an exception, uh, which means that we can uh, use a plus operator, which means that the code that, we, that would use this function is going to be simpler again, because it's not going to be plus of a, b, and result, it's just going to be uh, x equals a plus b. And if we want to rely on the type system, then we can eliminate the checks for rows and columns, because we can defer that uh, using templates, which means that we now uh, put the rows and the columns into the type, the compiler does all of that checking for us. We've now added more information to our type. And if we want to eliminate the imperative nature of this, uh, of this addition operation, we can rely on a standard algorithm, which means that given that we have a, uh, a row that is a range, we can now add them together and store them into the result. When C++20 rolls around, or if you're encouraging the use of third-party libraries such as range v3, then we can eliminate most of the iterators as well, which means the code is even simpler again. And finally, if you want to go fully functional, then you can describe the complete operation using a zip operation, which means that we're now, we've now got one expression that is going to be converted, uh, sorry, collapsed into a, um, into a matrix. Uh, Peter, I will get to you in just a moment. I've only got two slides left. So the relationship between C and C++ is not something that I am discouraging. That may not be apparent from everything that I've just talked about, but what I, uh, what I am advocating for is not that we don't teach C in a C++ course, more so the relationship between C and C++. What I'm saying is don't start by teaching C. Uh, start by teaching C++, start with what uh, make C++ easier to deal with than by dealing with C, and then bring in a, the C components when, uh, when students have sufficient maturity to actually interact with those and not be scared off. Uh, and this, uh, this can tie back into the history of where C++ comes from. You can talk about uh, C uh, and, its or and the origins of C++ in this component, which uh, would be at a later point in the course. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is to begin in a friendly way. And when teaching C++, uh, it is at least in my opinion that t starting with C is not a friendly manner because C++ code is simpler to deal with than C code. Now, I'm going to open the floor again. Peter, I believe you were first in the queue, then Guy. You had a number of examples that show arguing over matrices first by rows and by column. And that's the thing that I tend to notice as probably the performance impact that they uh, first want to iterate over columns and rows, depending on how they're set up. Sure. In the last few slides, that's not obvious at all which way around they're iterating. So if we go, whoop, wrong way, back to this one. Yes, that's so, the model that shows it. Yep. Then first iterating over rows and then columns within a row. So depending on how your matrices are stored, it may be fast, it may be slow, but in this case, I can see that, and in your next slide, I have no idea. 
So is that really, so just to summarize Peter's comment, uh, what Peter is saying is that in this particular slide, what we have, uh, we can see that we are iterating over uh, columns and rows, or rows and columns, depending on the implementation. Uh, whereas here, that is all abstracted away. Is that a good summary? Yeah. Okay, uh, can, uh, so I'm going to pose a counter question. Does knowing in this, uh, in this operation, whether or not we're column major or row major, uh, actually matter for addition? I don't know. I don't know if I should be seeing this. I, that's basically the point. What's your opinion about this? Which one of those would be preferable? Okay, so I would rather embed the structure of the type into the structure itself and then describe the operations as what they're doing rather than trying to achieve it as how they're doing it. Does that answer the question? Okay, then I believe Guy, then... Uh, some hands were, uh, no, okay. Guy, you're next. Okay, two things. Um, uh, so I'm writing a proposal for the new algebra in case you <laughs> <laughs> um, And one of the points that I raised during the proposal is how do we teach the new algebra because there's such a lot of um, sort of lexical furniture lurking around. I have to say, as soon as you went over C++ and introduced templates and angle brackets, lots of types, there's there's a, there's a whole lot of furniture there. And pro I'm probably just being really picky and feel free to demand a beer from me, but I don't think this is a good example of showing simplicity of C++ over C. So I'm not going to demand a beer from you, but I'm going to demand that beer time uh, where we can discuss this at length. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for this? Uh, so I saw Richard's hand first, then sorry, I don't know your name. Gail. Gail. So Richard, then Gail. That was this one here. Have I done something using non-C code in this example? Ah, yes. Well, it, uh, so I don't have a C program. I've got C like C++. Uh, you, you can write that in. I, I was wondering about that earlier when you posted the slides. You yeah. can write that in C if you're determined. Uh, also, you were making that. If you're attempting to do a compiler, because you're using a dark row, Yes, that would be a mistake on my part. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gail, you were next. Yeah, I wasn't sure at the conversation about uh, which version to show included some kind of element of uh, encouraging premature optimization in the students and starting to worry about how it's done too much rather than what you're achieving. Yeah. They're, you know, they're focusing on, on things that aren't pertinent to learning how to make it do it. So your concern, uh, your question here is, is a question concern yeah. is um, where you're, uh, whereby uh, the, the, is the focus um, on how it's being done, which could lead to premature optimization, as opposed to what's being done, which um, is describing the operation. Yeah. So that, that's why I'm in favour very much of uh, these two and the third one, uh, because that's describing the operation, what is happening. And if, uh, if you're going through this one here, it's much more of a, a how. Is that, is that Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's okay, yep. the best of the math for that very reason. Wonderful. Um, okay, so I believe someone at the back, then Simon. So I was thinking about the imperative value hammer versus the transform. Transform is the next one, yep. Okay, yep. Okay, I'm very glad that you brought that up because there was a point that I wanted to make earlier on that I forgot. And that's that uh, this is specifically for people with a C background. If your students already know C, then um, what you should be looking at doing is um, watching Dan Sachs' extern C um, uh, talk from CBPCon 2016, where he goes into a lot of detail about what, uh, what it's like to interact with C programmers. Uh, and taking their experience into consideration, in which case it may be easier for them to understand uh, this and relate to them using this sort of example as opposed to using the functional example. Yes, without discussion, that may not, uh, it, it may not be apparent. But yes, I, I'm not uh, disagreeing with you there at all. Uh, does that answer the question at least for now? Wonderful. Uh, Simon? And 
number of primitive operations which you're having to teach here. So if you go back to the, uh, the kind of Icarus example, so we have here like a, a reasonably small, although it's definitely an imperative style, we have a reasonably small set of um, uh, the features we have to understand. We have to understand indexing, we have to understand uh, our for loop syntax, um, iterating over things, uh, adding. This is like, this is stuff which we will use in a, in a variety of contexts. So then if we go to the, the final one, this one. So here we now need to understand how, um, how ranges work. We need to understand how this is abstracting all our iteration. We need to understand our function object which we're creating with plus. We need to understand how this is working internally and how we're iterating over the matrix. What, what's the, the kind of yep. uh, type which is actually being used so that how are things being added together? Is this a pair? Is this, what is this? So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you think this factors into the idea of simplicity. Uh, I disagree with you, by the way, on this point. I agree. I, I think maybe this conversation between Guy and myself needs to be expanded uh, into a larger group. Um, to uh, to get uh, get back to that simplicity, so you're, you're saying, uh, if I can uh, paraphrase, uh, that this there are relatively few things here. We've got uh, iterating, we have um, uh, comparison against rows and columns, and we have read and write. Is that a good summary? And then this one here, we have uh, we have construction, we have ranges to worry about, we have an operation, and we have the, the ranges themselves, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, this comes down to how you address uh, everything. So if you're, going to, uh, if you're going to address this to beginners, then I, I think that neither, sorry, beginners at the beginning of a course, I think that neither of these approaches is a good approach, because I think there's too much here for students to digest altogether. But what we can say is we can explain that zip, uh, zip width takes um, two, uh, two ranges. In this case, it takes a matrix A and a matrix B, uh, sorry, a row A and a row B, and then adds those two rows together and then um, stores that as another row. It stores it as a, a row to return. And then it does that for every single row in the matrix. And so it, we, can, uh, we can reason about it in essentially the same way but rather than describing how we're doing it, which is what's here, uh, this is very much a this is uh, this is very much a how we're going to achieve adding row to row or column to column. Uh, we're in this one here uh, explaining what it is that we're we're trying to achieve. Now, I uh, I think this discussion will uh, spiral for a little bit longer. Um, so I still have two minutes uh, allotted for this section. So uh, Guy, Gail, and Matthew. Um, I'm really going to say that possibly what's more interesting about this discussion is what this shows is that as the language is evolving, different things are popping to the top of the queue as things we talk about. Um, now that we've got ranges coming in, actually now we need to probably concentrate more on those things that we talked earlier than So the, the comment here was that as new things are being added to the language, um, uh, they're, they're being pushed to the top uh, for, for teachability reasons. And I th is that a good summary? Teachability order. Teachability order, sorry. Um, and I think that will be related to the final component of this, uh, of this presentation. So Gail, you were next. Yeah, so you said this is, uh, most of this is not about complete beginners, right? Yes. So Mm -hmm. You also said, related to their interests and what they can do with it, something like this relates much more clearly to, here, look, you go do this stuff with all that, without all that sort of things out, that you already know roughly how to do. Yes. So for that audience, this is appropriate material at this time. So to summarise that, you, if I understand you correctly, it would be a case of you're saying that because, uh, because you know your audience uh, and they would likely already have experience with, uh, because, because the, uh, the audience that I'm, I'm primarily talking about with our, our already programmers, they would probably have experience with this if they're coming from some other imperative programming language. Um, and so we can uh, talk about these, uh, these last three examples as a, way of, um, as a way of communicating what needs to be achieved. Yeah. Yeah, have I left anything out of that summary? Um, I'm not, I don't think I have to agree with you. I wouldn't do any of these with my absolute beginners. Wonderful. 
Sure, sure. Okay, so I do need to press on, Matthew. I did promise you a, a moment. Um, Okay. Um, well, thank you both for your, for your opinions. I do need to press on now because the next two topics are very important. But thank you, uh, thank you all for your input so far. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about is diversity and inclusion. And this is a very important topic uh, to, to talk about. And it's, uh, it, it's also a, a thing that uh, we as teachers have a responsibility to talk about. Uh, with our students and to lead by example, by ingraining this into our course. And the reason I say that is because teaching is a social activity. Teaching is something that we do by interacting with people. And if it hasn't uh, been made clear by, uh, by now, this talk is not so much about teaching C++ as it is interacting with your students. And so this means that we need to consider the backgrounds of people. We need to consider what it is that they have experienced. And we are not going to be privy to that. The majority of people in this room I do not know at all, and so I shouldn't be taking uh, my own, uh, I shouldn't make my own conclusions about what your experiences are like, because I haven't experienced that myself. And I am uh, I'm recommending that you take a look at Patricia Asser's uh, Deconstructing Privilege from NDC Oslo 2018, where Patricia breaks down what it means to have, uh, to have a privileged life, what it means to have experienced some form of hardship, what it means to, uh, for people to, in minorities to have experienced certain things that other people have not. Uh, what I would like for you to take away from this component is that you should try to see things honestly from another person's point of view. Because understanding another person's point of view is how we, uh, how we avoid ending up with software that misclassifies people as gorillas. How we can avoid having um, passport renewal software uh, state that it cannot find your face because the hairline that you have uh, is indistinguishable to the software uh, to the rest of your face how we can avoid soap dispensers from um, uh, dispensing soap to some people because their skin is lighter than other people's skin. I've seen uh, in my own workplace, uh, or workplaces, that um, uh, varying amounts of uh, sexism. And I have it on very good authority from some of my friends of overt sexism. Which, is, which makes the, what I have seen pale in comparison. And by having our teachers uh, and uh, ingrain the idea of improving diversity and including other people into the very nature of the, our courses, we can uh, move to make our world a better place. And so I would encourage you as teachers to help promote these ideas. And the best way to start is, oops, uh, the best way to start is to start watching Patricia's talk and to honestly see things from other people's points of view. <coughs> now, I don't have much time left, so I am going to power through to the end of the talk, which is, this is the final section, and then we'll have sufficient time for discussing everything. So, I would like to introduce you to the, standard, the C++ Standards Committee's direction group. We have... Over here on the left, Biana. Then we have Howard Hinnant, Roger Orr. Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way. Roger Orr, Howard Hinnant, Michael Wong, and then uh, David. And they are some of the committee's uh, most experienced C++ programmers. They are uh, also people who have 
a lot of experience with the standards committee. And the direction groups, or one of the direction groups' roles is to ensure that C++ continues to meet its, uh, meet, meets its goals and adheres to the philosophy of being a lightweight abstraction programming language. And they have concerns about education, uh, notably academia, consulting, and uh, internal training. And when the direction group was first trying to be established, Michael Wong, who also works for Codeplay, uh, asked me and uh, a few other uh, people within Codeplay to review the proposal to the committee uh, to establish said direction group. And I mentioned to Michael that it would be great uh, if there was a study group for, uh, for teaching C++. Now, for those who aren't familiar with how the committee works, uh, it's split into several groups, uh, some of which are called study groups, and these focus on one specific area of interest. For example, there's a study group uh, for concurrency and parallelism, there's a study group for uh, machine learning, there's a study group for human machine interfacing. Interfacing or interaction guy? Human machine interaction, thank you. Um, and so Michael went away and after the direction group was formed, he came back to me and said, that he would, like, uh, he would like me to look into this a bit further and that Biana would like uh, JC Van Winkle to look into this a bit further. And so we, uh, uh, we were introduced and JC and I then started planning a study group proposal. And JC came up with a brilliant idea to, uh, instead of prescribing uh, what curricula should look like and what teachers and, uh, and book authors and, uh, should be adhering to, Rather, they should cons uh, we should provide them with guidelines to consider, but not actually uh, say, this is what you must teach in order to be a standard conforming course. That way, if there's something that they disagree with, they can, uh, they can put that to the side, and if there are things that they agree with from another, uh, from another set of guidelines, they can add that. For example, teaching C++ to people who haven't written C++ before is going to be a very different course to teaching C++ to people who are working on embedded systems, and that, uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, cross-pollinate to build your course from guidelines. And so JC and I wrote a proposal to the committee, and the committee established SG20, which is, the, uh, which is a study group for education, specifically to discuss educational best practices uh, among teachers, so that way we can have a set of guidelines for various different, um, various different ideals. And so JC and I, because we can't, uh, we can't make every single committee meeting uh, independently, we are going to be co-chairing this, uh, this study group um, at uh, alternating uh, every meeting. Something that the, uh, the study group is uh, very much in favour of are what we call Tony tables. These are more commonly known as before and after tables, whereby on the, uh, the left-hand side we have uh, current C++, uh, what, what we would be expected to do today. And then on the right, we have what, uh, what you might be able to do uh, if a particular uh, proposal is accepted. In this case, we have on the left um, what, contracts, what needs to be done to have contracts today. Um, and on the right, we have what language-based contracts can achieve. And something that uh, JC noticed in Gornishinov's, or one of Gornishinov's papers about, um, about Coroutines are what JC and I are now calling Gore tables. And a Gore table is essentially a table that divides users into varying groups. So at the top we have uh, everybody, and then on the right side we have uh, what uh, everybody is able to do using coroutines. And then we refine each group until we reach the experts of the experts, and we say what they should be able to do using whatever is in this proposal. And that helps break down the teachability of uh, of a particular proposal. For example, if we expect everybody to use coroutines via high-level syntax powered by coroutine types and awaitables defined by the standard library, Boost and other high-quality libraries, then this means that teachers can go away, can look at this proposal and go away and look at um, what they need to add to their course or their book. And they can, uh, they, if they're targeting uh, beginners who are going to be learning about coroutines, 
they, they don't need to worry about the awaitable concepts because that's not something that is relevant to everyone, that's relevant to power users and experts and cream of the crop. But the thing that the, uh, the SG20 is most uh, interested in are the educational guidelines. So on screen, I have a few examples from a proposal that proposes uh, educational guidelines for teaching C++ to beginners uh, that are programmers already. And so we have uh, things that I've talked about in this uh, presentation, such as delaying features until there is a genuine use case and tooling, and what some of those guidelines might look like. The one thing that I haven't talked about, and I'm going to briefly discuss now, are student outcomes. Student outcomes are essentially a list of things that you expect a student to be able to do upon completing a particular module of your course. And you can derive these from uh, uh, student objectives. These are essentially what they should be able to walk away from, what skills, what understanding, and what knowledge they have. I do not expect you to read what's on screen, by the way. Uh, there are, I think, 14 or 15 uh, different ob uh, objectives, and these are essentially saying that you can, uh, you can do these things. So you should be able to uh, develop these kinds of skills, and you should be able to do these things after having developed said skills, which is a way to assess what, uh, what skills you have developed. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, the objectives, and then on the right-hand side, we have the outcomes, which describe what you should be able to do once you have developed this skill. And if you'd like to learn more about these papers, you can always uh, head to wg21.link slash the P number that is at the front of all of these proposals. I do strongly recommend that you read 939 and 1231. So in summary, when you're teaching, Oh, sorry? No worries. Is there anyone else that would like to... I see a few more cameras at the back. Okay. Anyone else? Nope. All right. In summary, when you're teaching, I would like you to consider promoting a culture that encourages diversity and inclusion not starting with the old stuff because it came first, uh, encouraging use of tooling, reading design and evolution and the history of programming languages, specifically the C++ sections, introducing your content only when it's relevant, and if you can or are interested, participating in standardizing the educational guidelines through SG20. You can do that via emailing myself or JC. Uh, there will be another slide that covers all of this. If you'd like to attend the next C++ standards meeting, that is in Cologne, Germany. Uh, and you can find the details for that um, uh, on the ISO CPP website. Now, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I hope that you can uh, take some of what this talk has discussed and uh, go forth and influence the next generation of programmers. Thank you. <laughs>